Hi, my name is DJ Lakaredi. I'm from the Kansas City Heart Rhythm Institute. Today we have Dr. Chris Porterfield joining us from Aurora Denver Cardiology. He's an electrophysiologist there, and uh, so we're going to share some interesting and exciting insights about the varipulse real-world data. So, Chris, you just presented the real-world data on the use of varipulse at the Kansas City Heart Rhythm Symposium as a late breaker. Uh, tell me more about what, we, what you found. Yeah, this is exciting because it's really the first time we're presenting the data. Uh, this was uh, 200 patients from the Real AF observational trial and uh, allowed us to really look at safety outcomes and endpoints uh, of these uh, patients. Uh, it was interesting because this was uh, both paroxysmal and persistent patients from over 70 sites. Um, we've been able to utilize high volume uh, centers to collect data and look at after the second uh, iteration of the when the catheter was re-released to make sure that this was safe uh, a safe catheter with good outcomes. There was only one event, um, and this was non-stroke related, uh, and uh, so a very safe profile um, with good uh, endpoints from uh, the uh, procedural data. So. I mean, we know that the varipulse catheter was introduced to the market and then subsequently taken out. What are the changes that were made to the catheter design or the procedural flow that made this catheter safer and effective now? So I think uh, two things. One, um, truly understanding the, uh, how this device works, the workflow of the device, and uh, we also changed the flow rate uh, from four to 30 milliliters per minute, uh, which helped to reduce the thermal injury to uh, tissue. And so I think um, those two things in itself, but really uh, stepping back to, uh, as an electrophysiologist, understanding the, some of the things with pulse field um, and understanding uh, what could happen with uh, this energy and uh, trying to reduce stroke rates with uh, the increased flow rates, which we've seen to be uh, hopefully very beneficial. So there is a lot of conversation about lesion stacking. I mean, it, it, it applies for RF, it applies for PF as well. But it, can you specifically comment on lesion stacking with the varicose catheter? Sure. Um, as with uh, most PFA systems, uh, additional stacking only increases the thermal Portion. It's not really a, adding additional lesion depth, and so we typically do not recommend stacking uh, with any uh, PFA system, but Veripulse specifically. So uh, doing two applications uh, with orthogonal lesions uh, gives you a good density of, of uh, ablation, and that's not, um, you don't need to apply multiple uh, ablations stacked on top of each other. So, um, I mean, having used other type of single shot catheters from a PFA perspective, how do you find the varipulse catheter to be advantageous in terms of how you do your AFib? Yeah, I think it's just the workflow. We're comfortable with uh, using Cardo. Uh, we are able to do zero uh, fluoroscopy. And as with this study uh, showing a significant amount of users able to maintain that zero fluoroscopy, uh, was important, and that's important for, for most of us because we don't want to have to, you know, go back to wearing lead. Um, but it, it uh, the visualization, the ability to see lesions uh, applied to the field, to your map, consistently and reproducibly so that you know exactly where your lesions are going to be uh, has been helpful. I think that that's, that integration with ICE, uh, with mapping, and high density mapping has been uh, to its advantage to allow for Veripulse to be a, a, a strong contender in the catheters that we use for uh, PFA. I mean, I, I, I definitely see a shift towards not really worrying about the substrate mapping aspects of uh, an AFib ablation procedure nowadays with a lot of these single shot catheters. So how important do you think uh, substrate mapping or understanding of what is it that you're dealing with, whether in the form of voltage or activation in your procedural workflow? It's extremely important. It's, uh, you know, we're electrophysiologists. Uh, we have to understand the substrate before we ablate. If you just do uh, PVI alone, you're going to miss some of the patients. Uh, if you're not in trying to do an EP study or induction, 
post, you're going to miss some of the arrhythmias. Uh, and that's a fine strategy if you want to uh, bring the patients back. Uh, but if you want to be a comprehensive electrophysiologist, I think you should map. I mean, I, I see that the study had both paroxysmal as well as the persistent AFib population. Did you guys do the PBI only, or did you do PBI plus as well in this, and then how did you accomplish that? So 10% uh, of the patients had posterior wall isolation, and that was, uh, this is a standard of care uh, study. So it was up to the discretion of the electrophysiologist. And so for those patients who require a cable trachus for instance for right atrial flutters, do you use the varipulse or do you pull out a regular SDSF catheter? So I, I, I go to RF. Um, for now, I'm, I'm solely using RF on the CTI just uh, for uh, both for keeping the, the lesion smaller um, and uh, just concerns of uh, coronary spasm. So, I mean, all of this is really exciting. Um, there was a small problem, or depending on who you talk to, there was a problem, and then I think the industry was able to identify that. They, they fixed the workflow, they fixed the, uh, the energy delivery. Avoiding lesion stacking really became important, and I see that FDA has just given its green light for this catheter to be put to use in the real world. So how do you see um, this particular catheter play out in this very quickly overcrowded market of PFA? Um, I think with people who are comfortable with a fluoroless system with sound mapping, good uh, integration of ice, I really think that it will uh, favor the workflow that a lot of us are so accustomed to. Um, with the pipeline of new products coming down the market, we'll be seeing uh, the next generation, uh, new waveforms, new catheters uh, that will be complementing what we're doing today. Um, and I think the safety profile is uh, stronger. I think in general, we need to understand pulse field, what it does to the endothelium, what it does to uh, cells, platelets, uh, red blood cells during uh, electroporation, uh, to understand what's going on with the uh, thrombotic state. Um, but I think this catheter is as safe uh, as any other system on the market, and in my opinion, it's uh, even safer now than it was. I mean, I, I think like everything else in life, um, understanding the tool that you're using is extremely important. And then also taking the time um, to really follow the steps, I think, is equally more important. So I think a lot of times uh, we as electrophysiologists, we assume many things, but I think it's time with the heterogeneity of the construction and architecture of these catheters, it's very important to pay attention to the details of what is it that we are, we're dealing with. Correct. I think lack of that foundation knowledge oftentimes leads to I would say, uh, a less effective and safer way of using these tools. So I think this really brings up a very important point. So what does the future look like? Uh, what does this data mean? And what are we looking at um, in the next one, five, or 10 years? I think, uh, you know, we're moving towards trying to ablate in the ventricle. Um, we're going to have technology that's going to be supporting uh, single shot therapies in the ventricle, um, which will be uh, quite interesting space. Uh, but what we're uh, looking at now as far as the first in one year, we're going to see different wavelengths, uh, different uh, therapeutic uh, tools to get us to have uh, even more substrate uh, taken out in the left atrium. Uh, and I think the integration of mapping, understanding substrate, we still do not understand persistent AFib. Uh, and so I think that that portion of uh, integrating with a pulse field system is going to be very, very high yield for us in the AFib market. Um, I mean, we know that the smart pulse catheter is just on the horizon, mm -hmm. ready to get out any time. And uh, are you excited about it? It will be good to have uh, a uh, SDSF again. Uh, you know, so many of us use that uh, over the past decade that we really, I miss uh, having uh, the ability to do linear lines. Um, 
And so I think that that will be a, a great complement to what we have available uh, currently with uh, the larger catheters. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, I mean, I'm one of those guys that likes the, the four millimeter tip, the smaller tip, yeah. gives you the elegance of precision. You really don't have to nuke the whole atrium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, especially for cases that when you have a good reentrant, both macro as well as micro or even focal lesions, that are oftentimes valuable, um, the current single shot catheters are significantly limited, right? So, I mean, to your point, uh, how much are you willing to do in your first attempt? Or is AFM going to really become a stage procedure to some degree? I think that's something that we've got to really reassess. I think if you are the patient, you really want your doctor to really take care of everything in one shot while you're there, right? Yeah. So take care of, address, know, understand the substrate, Make sure you target all the appropriate lesions that you really needed to do. And then if there are more things identified, if I were the patient, I want them to be treated. <clears throat> For example, I give you a case um, a, a few weeks ago where the patient, we were doing a single sharp catheter approach with PFA and the patient had an AVNRT, yeah. right? We were completely unprepared to really deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I think those case scenarios happen frequent enough that we should be open to the idea of figuring out tools or using the tools that would enable us to really do a comprehensive job. Correct. So thank you very much for your time and uh, great to see you. Yeah, always good to see you.